Hello and welcome back everyone. Last time I showed you how to texture your logo. Now that we have successfully managed to achieve that, we of course want to transfer our data to other programs. So far Modo is more or less just a modeler with a built-in renderer for still images. Since it has no animation or other tools of that kind, you may want to transfer your textures and models to other programs. I will try to show you how to do just that. Let's get to work. As you can see, I have once again modified our DVD logo and added some stuff. I have added a light inset bevel to accentuate the contour. I have also added a number of rivets. The rivets shall convey the illusion that our logo has been tacked to a wall of metal plates. I also modeled this wall of course. If we switch to the render try layout, we can see that iView shows us our scene with all textures already in place. I have adjusted them in such a way that they convey the illusion of everything being made of metal. I didn't aim for ultimate realism, but to make things more interesting I have added rust and a few other artifacts. I have also varied the color of the metals a little so our logo stands out. I did this because I didn't want to work with excessive reflections. If we had strong reflections we could make our logo a pure chrome material and could make the walls a less reflective material. If you look at the shader tree, you can see that each material contains several textures. I have only used procedurals again to keep things simple. The DVD logo has three separate materials. One for the rivets, one for the base of the logo and another for the contours of the logo. Within these materials the textures are contained. I have grouped those three textures to have less clutter in my shader tree. If I draw up my arrows in the shader tree, I only have two main groups that represent my materials. An important prerequisite for all baking is that UV maps are in place. You may ask why. So far we only have used procedural textures. Since these are defined mathematically, they can spread in 3D space without problems. However, we now want to bake them to pixels and therefore our 3D program must know how it shall treat the image once it is created. More specifically, the 3D program needs to know how it shall wrap the image around our mesh. UV mapping is considered an art in itself, so I'm going to spare you the details. If you need more specific information on UV mapping, you can find a lot about this on the net. For our purposes we will settle with simple automatically created UV maps. We won't adjust them because we only have a hard body model that should not expose any problems with distortions. If you were to do an organic model, you needed to adjust and tweak your UV map until you get rid of those distortions. This is usually the hard part and that is why it is referred to as an art. As an example this would be needed if you were to map a face with a texture of the skin. You wouldn't want the lips, wrinkles and other important details of the face to appear in the wrong place. Since our rivets consist of separate geometry and have a separate material, we will not include them in our UV map. We can always recreate our materials for the rivets in other programs as well because of that. One rule about UV maps is keep them as simple as possible. To temporarily make the rivets disappear we will be hiding them. Let's select them using the Info and Statistics palette and then we simply choose Hide Selected. After that we need to select all the polygons that we want to include in our UV map. In our case this is the DVD and the little disk below it. I'm only selecting two polygons and then I use Select Connected to select the rest of the geometry. After that we need to create a UV map. This is done best in the vertex map list by choosing New Map. Let's give it a sensible name. In this case I call them Bake UVs. When we now switch to our UV 3D split view, we can see that our UV map is empty. It does not contain any UVs in relation to our polygons. To change that we are using the Create UV tool from the menu. As I already said, we are trying to keep our maps as simple as we possibly can and therefore I'm choosing the Atlas mapping from the projection method. When I click in the viewport to activate the tool, our UVs will be created in our map. As you can see, these are simple straight on projections and they are placed very cleanly across the UV space. Now we need to do the same for our wall. 
Once again, we are creating a new UV map, which I now call Wall UVs. With the Create UV tool selected, I now choose a simple planar projection along the Z-axis. This is the most efficient way, since our wall only consists of flat polygons. With the UV maps in place, let's move on to the actual baking process. The simplest way to bake something in Modo is to assign a new empty image to a UV map. Since Modo is also a fully fledged painting app, of which I will tell you more later, in the Modo Tools palette under the Paint section there is already a button in place that will give you this functionality at a click with your mouse. Modo will ask you where you want to store your file and what image resolution you want to use. You can choose between various pre-made sizes and as you may notice, all of them represent a square image. This is due to the fact that Modo uses OpenGL for displaying these images as textures in its viewports. Modo can also handle non-square images, but due to the nature of OpenGL, square images will simply be faster. As you can also see, as you can also see, Modo is able to handle floating point formats such as HDR or OpenEXR. For our purposes we will not use this option, however. I will illustrate the use of the floating point option later when we move on to painting. Your image will be added to the shader tree. Just like all the other items there, you need to drag it in the appropriate place. In the most common situations you will want to place your image directly above the property or item you want to bake. Since the shader tree works from bottom to top, you can explicitly control which pixels are evaluated by placing your texture in the appropriate slot. Just like with procedurals, the default setting for the image texture is to use the diffuse color. In our example, the first thing that we want to bake is ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is a simple way of capturing how light behaves in the real world. In grooves and tight edges, light will dissipate more quickly than in open areas. Ambient occlusion captures this. This is a common technique to give your images more depth. To get access to the ambient occlusion calculation, we need to switch the render output accordingly. Once we have done so, all we need to do is right click on our image in the shader tree and choose bake from the menu. The baking process will start. Since ambient occlusion takes a short while to bake, I have edited out this portion. You will see the baking window later on. While we have our render output switched to ambient occlusion, we are also baking ambient occlusion for the wall. All we need to change is to switch our UV map from bake UVs to wall UVs and of course we also need to apply a new image that can accommodate our pixel data. After baking ambient occlusion, all that remains to be done is to bake the procedurals on the wall. For this purpose we are just switching our render output back again to shader tree and with a new blank image applied we choose our wall UVs again. We can then immediately start the baking process and as I promised you, I'm showing you the baking window as well. It is identical to the render output window and displays a set of useful data. Once we have baked all our maps, the last thing that remains to be done is to export our geometry. I'm choosing file export as from the menu and in the file requester that comes up, we have the choice between a few different formats. The two choices of interest to us are the Light Wave Object Format and the Alias Motion Builder Format FBX. Since Modo does not yet have animation or anything of that kind, choosing FBX may look a bit strange, but it is a very nice format to get your geometry across between programs. Another option that we could have chosen is the Wavefront Object Format, but because it's a very old format and can only handle one UV map at a time, it would not be that efficient to adjust our geometry just for that. Therefore, we are settling for the other options. I'm exporting my meshes once as a Lightwave object and then again as a FBX file. The first program we are going to use our baked maps in is Cinema 4D. Using the file Open Option from the menu, I can import my FBX file. This will give me the geometry, including all my predefined selections, as well as all my four materials. It will also import lights and cameras, but as you can see in the scene browser, 
it will import those as geometry as well. This is of course completely useless, so we are going to delete the last two items at a given point. We will be recreating the light and the camera with Cinema's own equivalents. In addition to importing our maps, we need to generally adjust our materials a little. Values that work in Modo must not necessarily work in other programs. In most cases, specularity and diffuse amount are completely off, so you need to adjust those. Colors come across fine in most cases. In order to use our images as textures for the materials in Cinema 4D, we simply load them as images in the proper channel. For the wall, I'm loading the diffuse color into the color channel. You will notice that our texture projection is set to spherical. By choosing the material tag on our object and setting its projection mode to planar for the wall, we can correct that. We also need to adjust the size of our texture projection. I'm simply typing in the values. But of course, you would do this interactively. By default, Cinema 4D will not use the diffusion property for its materials. Therefore, you must first activate it under the basic tab. Once that is done, you can load our ambient occlusion image into that channel. After I have adjusted my materials a little more, as well as recreating my lighting and camera setup from Modo, our scene is ready to render. A quick test render already shows that we are pretty close to what we have done in Modo. Now let's try and do the same in Lightwave 3D. Just as in Cinema 4D, we are loading our object. In this case, Lightwave's native format, which is of course the Lightwave object. One very big advantage with that is that our textures are already in place. We do not need to reapply them. On a tight production deadline, this can save you considerable time. After some minor adjustments and repositioning of my camera, my scene is ready to render. Again, with only minor effort, our scene looks pretty much like the one we created in Modo. Since we already have baked the effects that usually make up a large part of the rendering time into our textures, rendering in Lightwave or Cinema 4D is considerably faster than if we were rendering those effects there. This is particularly useful if you need to render long animations. The only downside to this is that of course our baked pixels do not react to the environment. So if your lighting changes a lot during your animation, this technique is of course not applicable. It is also not exclusive to Modo, but for instance in Cinema 4D it requires the advanced render plugin and it still takes a lot longer than in Modo. The same is true for Lightwave. I hope I could illustrate the benefits of Modo for baking convincingly and I look forward to seeing you in my next article. Until then, bye bye.